And now if you would turn in your Bibles, please, to the 19th chapter of St. Luke. Luke chapter 19, we'll begin with verse 1. May we hear the inspired word of the living God. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And may God speak to us today through his word, and may his name ever be praised. Amen. All religions are alike. Did you ever hear anybody say that? I'm sure that most of you have. When they do, there's one thing you probably want to remember, that anybody that makes that statement is really declaring that they know little or nothing about other religions, or little or nothing about Christianity, and most likely, little or nothing about either. Because nothing could be further from the truth. Oh, there are some minor similarities in ancillary things, but when it comes to the great verities, the great central truths of Christianity, it is totally diametrically opposite to all other religions. To wit, only Christianity teaches that its founder is God, who declares himself to have been the creator of the world, the one who has been from everlasting, who is found to be none other than the divine Son of God come from heaven. No other religion finds that its founder dies for the sins of the world, only Christ. Mohammed never died for the sins of anyone, neither did Lao Tse, or uh, neither did Zoroaster or Confucius. None of these died for the sins of the world, only Christ is a savior. And furthermore, having died, the founders of all of the other religions have not been heard from since. But Christ alone, in stark contradiction to all of the rest, arose gloriously, triumphantly from the dead and is alive forevermore. Fourthly, all other religions teach that salvation is by human merit, by human goodness, by human piety, by human worth. Only Christ teaches us that salvation is free, that it is by grace, that it is unearned, undeserved, that it is not by human meriting at all. Today, I would like to add another to that list. In all other religions, the essence of it is that man is seeking after their gods. Not only are they seeking to find them, but they are seeking to placate or propitiate these angry gods as well. Quite conversely, 
Christianity teaches that God is seeking us. That Christ is the great divine seeker of human souls. Our text today described why he came. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save the lost. That's why Christ came, because God is seeking us. And though people may seek after false gods, fallen man does not truly seek after the true God, the holy God, the God who is of purer eyes than to look upon iniquity. As Dr. Samuel Johnson, the British gentleman that gave us the first English dictionary said that most men spend all of their lives rushing from one diversion to another in order that they might not think about their own mortality or about that one who is seeking them. And so we go to one diversion after another. And I should remind you that if you're looking for a place to hide, the best place is church. There are some of you right here, this hour, in this sanctuary, who are hiding from God. Because you see, you can assuage your own guilty conscience by saying to it, look, O oh conscience, how religious I am. Here I am, right in the midst of the people of God, singing the praises of the Almighty. But Jesus said, Ye draw nigh unto me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Where is your heart right now? For some of you it is business. For some of you it is money. For others it is ple pleasure or sex. For some it is fame. Whatever it may be, you're seeking the things of this world rather than seeking a true relationship with God. Why? God loves us, which is the motivation behind his seeking us. Why would we flee from that? It is because Satan has corrupted our minds and deluded us into believing that God is an ogre. That's exactly what he did with Eve. For God knows that in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt become as gods. It will be psychedelic, God mind expanding. And God is mean, narrow, and doesn't want you to have such joy, and so he has commanded you not to eat that. And there are many people who suppose that if they ever found themselves in the arms of God, he would make them miserable. And so they flee elsewhere. In 1887, there was a great stirring in a British journal that uh, was edited by Wilfred Maynell because they received a rather shoddy-looking and soiled package which contained within it a number of pieces of paper equally stained and wrinkled. But on those pieces of paper there was written with pen and pencil and of all different kinds some of the most magnificent poetry that the editor had ever read in his life, signed by someone that he had never heard of. Immediately, a search was instituted. There was no address. There was no one that knew him. It was impossible to locate him. And so, at length, he decided that he would publish these poems and invite the writer to come to his office and meet him. And so he did, and some time later, there was a knock at the door. And he said, come, 
And the door opened and a man took one step into the room and then withdrew his foot and closed the door. He said, come in. The door opened again and the man took two steps into the room and then withdrew and closed the door a second time. He sat there in amazement. At length, the door opened once more and a shabbily dressed figure shuffled into the room. He was dressed far worse than the average beggar. In fact, he had no shirt or undershirt at all, but only a torn and stained coat which almost covered his naked bones of his ribs that showed through, indicating the man was close to starvation. He looked down and his toes protruded through broken shoes. The man was a wreck. And he finally spoke and said, I am the man that wrote that poetry. I am Francis Thompson. Now I would like to think that all of you now immediately know who that is, but uh, alas, I'm afraid that that's probably not the case. His greatest poem has been considered the most wonderful lyric ever penned in the English language. But happily, Maynell and his wife took this beggar into their home and saw to his physical needs, clothed him and fed him and nursed him back to health and discovered here is a man that was studying medicine and doing very, very poorly. And he left his home and ran away after eight years in college and found his place among the lowest of the low and the vilest of the vile in the slums of London. He slept usually on an embankment under a bridge in the Thames River or sometime on a concrete ledge protruding from a building with a discarded newspaper as his only blanket. He ate whatever scraps of food he could, could on occasion find. And he wrote these poems sometimes at night with a paper against a wall and a stub of a pencil under the candle the lamplight from a lamppost nearby. But this man heard from Maynell the gospel of Christ. He had heard much of it before, but he wanted nothing to do with it, and he had fled. But now the love of Christ seemed to reach out and grasp his heart, and he invited the living Savior into his life. And his life was utterly transformed. And then is when he wrote his most famous poem. It has been likened unto the work of Milton. It is a glorious poem. I won't quote the whole of it, but just the first and the last stanzas. You probably recognize it now. It's entitled, The Hound of Heaven, like the hound of the Baskervilles. Francis Thompson had conceived that God was some kind of monster and that should he get his claws into him, he would destroy him or make his life utterly even more miserable than it was. And so he fled from God. He fled into the slums, he fled among the, the vilest of people. He fled into opium. He fled seeking for joy and happiness into the realm of uh, arms of a young woman. He turned to children to find a, try to find some joy and could not find it there. Nothing satisfied, and yet he continued to plod step after step, looking over his shoulder, lest that red-eyed hound with its huge fangs should overtake him. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. 
I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind, and in the midst of tears I hid from him, and under running laughter, up vistaed hopes I sped, and shot precipitated adown titanic glooms of chasm fears from those strong feet that followed, followed after. But with unhurrying chase and unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, they beat, and a voice beat more instant than the feet. All things betray thee who betrayest me. And now, of that long pursuit comes on at hand the brute that voice is round me like a bursting sea lo all things fliest thee who fliest me alack where will you find any to set thee love apart Seeing none but I make much of naught, he said, and human love needs human meriting. And how hast thou merited of all man's clotted clay, thou the dingiest clot? Whom wilt thou find to love ignoble thee, save only me, only me? Halts by me that footfall. Is my gloom, after all, shade of his hand outstretched caressingly? Ah, fondest, blindest, weakest. I am he whom thou seekest. Thou drivest love from thee, who drivest me. In a way, that is the autobiography, not only of Francis Thompson, but of most of us. How many of us have spent years seeking to flee from God in the pursuit of every other sort of hope of happiness, only to find that nothing satisfies, to discover, as St. Augustine did, that thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless till they rest in thee. Have you vainly sought that peace and rest, that joy and fulfillment in the things of this world? Ah, dear friend, you cannot run a jet plane on tomato juice, and you can't produce a satisfied heart on the material things of this world. Our heart is a God-shaped blank, and only God can fill it, and will never really know life until we really know him. I know that in my own life I can testify to this. Though reared in Sunday school and church as a child as soon as able, in my early teens I squawked loudly enough that my parents quit sending me. Note well, sending me. And for 10 years, I had nothing to do with Christ. Oh, I sought my pleasures, my fulfillment, my joy, the meaning of my life in all of the things of this world, and found, I thought, some little satisfaction in it all. 
but I could go day after day, week after week, month after month, without ever giving Christ one single thought. And yet, if you had asked me if I were a Christian, believe it or not, I would have said yes. But then, after that long pursuit, there came a day when sound asleep in my bedroom, the Spirit of God slipped right in the window, turned on my alarm clock radio. And there he spoke to me through the lips of Donald Gray Barnhouse, 1,500 miles away in Philadelphia. And he told me about that love. And he told me about that wondrous, matchless grace. And that how he had loved me even unto Calvary. And there he had paid for all of my sins and he desired to forgive me, to pardon me, to cleanse me, and to make me anew. I was overwhelmed and at length falling on my knees on the floor of that apartment, I cried out, oh God, I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know that that was you that was seeking me. I didn't know that you loved me even unto the cross. I didn't know that you were willing to forgive me for all of my sins and accept me just as I was. And I said, oh God, I am sorry. I am sorry. I am sorry. I am so sorry. And I rose up a new creature. I had been found by him. Yes, indeed. I was one of those of whom it says, I will be found of them that sought me not. For I had sought him not at all, and yet was found. Ah, dear one, have you been found of Christ? He calls you to seek him, but you will discover that in the seeking, you are not the true seeker. I sought the Lord, says the hymn, and afterward I knew he moved my soul to seek him, seeking me. Twas not I that found, O Savior, true. No, I was found of thee. Have you been found by Christ? He is knocking at your door. He is seeking you, some of you, through the long years and decades of your life. And you have steadily maintained your resistance kept that door locked and did not want to have anything to do with him, really. But he is the lover of your soul. He is the divine seeker of your heart. His banner over you is naught but love. He has nothing planned for you but that which is good. Without him, all of the good things in your life will come to naught. With him, he will turn everything unto good. And without him, finally, having rejected his grace, you must face his justice at that great assize, at that final judgment. And there all of your sins now hidden, for you are a respectable man. You are an upstanding man. You are a respectable woman, but God knows your sin. And one day, all of the world will know it. Unless you come to him 
whose blood can cleanse from every sin, whose, who has promised to take our sins and to bury them into the depths of the sea, never to remember them against us anymore. Ah, fondest, blindest, weakest, I am he whom thou seekest. You're seeking for joy. You're seeking for fulfillment. You're seeking for love. You're seeking for meaning. And he is the answer to all of those quests. Won't you seek him right now? May we pray. <clears throat> oh Christ, move in the hearts of some this day. Move them to seek thee as thou art seeking them. And may some say this very hour, Oh, Lord Jesus, I didn't realize how great was your love, how blind I was, how easily deceived by Satan. But right now, I would embrace that love and be embraced. I would trust in thee as Savior and Lord. I surrender my life unto thee. O thou divine seeker, in thy name, amen. This has been a production of Truth in Action Ministries.